Mark both mentioned this morning, we're super fortunate here at PBS to have Mark join us for our fourth time. He's been so wonderful about coming and speaking to our community, but also taking time to speak with our teachers, speak with our parents, and so this will be another wonderful family ed session. Um, I actually got to go and do a training with Mark in October this past year. It was very inspiring, so I'm excited for you to hear a little bit more about some of the initiatives that he's bringing to the Yale Center for Emotional Intelligence, but also all around the world these days. So, you ready? All right. All right, let's do this. Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Good morning. So can I ask you how you're feeling again? Yeah. <laughs> Joyful. See that? Um, so Scott uh, had asked me to, uh, well firstly, I, since this is um, like the fourth time here, um, how many of you have come to one of these before? Raise your hand. Okay, so good number of you. That's good, because I won't repeat a lot of what I've done before. Um, so as you know, my day job is, um, I'm a professor of psychology and also the director of what we call the Center for Emotional Intelligence. We're a growing group. I think last year when I was here, we had about 24 members. Now we're at 39. Uh, anticipate that we'll have 50 employees in our center by the end of next year. So we're growing rapidly. Uh, our biggest project now is that we convince the mayor of New York and the chancellor to bring our approach to every school across the five boroughs of New York. So I was like, excited. I was in a training with about 75 high school principals in Brooklyn the day before I left here, and I was like, I need to go back to New Haven. Uh, it, was, it was intimidating. You know, these are, it's, um, it's hard work. And, you know, one of the things that I'm interested in is the language of emotion. Uh, and I'll just share with you why. So I was a kid who was not a good student. I didn't like school. I, uh, I hated school, actually, when I was young. And it was mostly because I had anxiety problems and I was horrifically bullied in my school. And I had two wonderful parents, just like many of you are wonderful parents. Um, but my parents didn't really have the strategies. So my father, who was a tough guy from the Bronx, his whole thing was, Mark, toughen up, right? And I don't know, I actually went into the martial arts to toughen up. I have a fifth degree black belt. But do I look like a tough guy? <laughs> like I never became a tough guy. I mean, I could, you know, I'm not afraid to fight anybody, mostly, but um, I'm still not a tough guy. It's just not in my genes. Like my genetics, I'm not a tough guy. My mother, who also loved me dearly, um, a little bit of neurotic, you know, we all have that neurosis in our family. All she ever told me was how much she loved me. Don't worry, honey, your mother loves you. And I'd be like, well, like, when, you're, when the kids are like throwing me into my locker, your love is not helping me. So I need some skills. Um, and then I had this very special person in my life whose name was Uncle Marvin. And Uncle Marvin was my mother's brother. And he happened to be this middle school teacher in the Catskill Mountains of New York State. And he happened to be this maverick educator who decided uh, in, his middle, in the middle of his career that the entire New York State social studies program was just a piece of garbage. And he said that he couldn't get students to be engaged in learning. Like nobody, remember this is back, he, is, he passed away a couple years ago at 85. So we're talking, you know, the 60s and 50s, 70s. And he said, you know, I'm working with the sons and daughters of farmers and people who work at hotels in the Catskill Mountains. Like these kids are coming in tired from milking the cows in the morning and then I'm trying to teach them the Roman oligarchy. Right, like there's not like, what is the connection in terms of like their everyday life and what they're learning in social studies? So he had this epiphany that the missing link was emotion. The missing link was feeling. The missing link was that how could these students who were coming in from their homes relate to the characters, Julius Caesar or whoever it was that he was teaching? And he said it has to be through their shared experience. So he started building a program that he called the Feeling Words Curriculum. And it was this interesting approach to teaching social studies through the language of emotion. And of course, um, you know, if you know this little area in the Catskill Mountains of New York, 
it wasn't the most innovative you know, education system at that time. Um, and he got thrown under the bus. So people were just like, this is ridiculous. You know, parents started complaining. The superintendent didn't think it was good. Nevertheless, he persisted. And I tell you the story because um, what's interesting is that he actually retired early from being a teacher. He was also, the reason why he got into education was he was also a band leader. So he played the trumpet by night at the hotels and he taught by day. And he said, like, why is it that, you know, when I'm doing my gigs at the hotels, everybody's like in it and they're feeling it. And then I come to the classroom and they're not feeling it. Like, what's the missing piece? And it was that emotion piece. Um, the most interesting to me professionally, just as a quick aside, so that school district literally threw my uncle under the bus. They said, you can't do this, this is a distraction. Um, so he just said, like, this is my passion, and he left the teaching profession. Just this year, that school district called my center saying, we desperately need your program, <laughs> which I thought was a nice little thing to my uncle. No, he's not here anymore. But what I, what I bring this up because what did save me, I believe, was sitting down with my uncle at 13 years old and him giving me the language for my emotional experiences. So he gave me meaning, he gave me language. So I learned that I was feeling alienated, that I was feeling different, that I was feeling not part of something, that I was excluded, that I was isolated. And then he said, well, let's think about strategies. Like, what do you do with those feelings? Where do they come from? And how do you manage them effectively? Now he and I spent five years when I was in my early 20s writing a book on this. And of course, I didn't even have a graduate degree at that point, and uh, he was already in his 70s, retired. So the book is nothing I would ever ask anyone to buy, because <laughs> uh, it was like this narcissistic, retired uncle with like a know-it-all 22-year-old. Um, just not good. Um, nevertheless, I did get into academia and started testing these ideas out, and then started learning kind of what I didn't know, and also what Uncle Marvin didn't know also, because he was just an amazing teacher. Um, he wasn't uh, a scientist. Anyhow, the long story short is that we had to build other tools, like this tool that you may have seen here, the mood meter. We needed to build basic tools to help people just learn about feelings. We needed to teach people that there is something called an emotion and that it matters, and it matters for really important reasons, like how you focus and how you learn and how you make decisions and how you build relationships and how you deal with stress, and how you engage in creative processes. And I, I say this because we had to build all these tools, right? And then all of a sudden, this feeling words curriculum that my uncle had created back in the 60s and 70s, when I started teaching it after these tools, all the teachers would say things like this. Where has this been? Like, why have you taught us this? And I find it really interesting that the, um, if you go too deep too soon, especially with things like emotions, you can turn people off. Think about it, right? People, we're not in a society that is that comfortable talking about emotion. Would you agree or disagree? Right? It's still seen as like, as soft skills, right? Or, um, you know, I, I've been around the world a dozen times now, talking to different populations of educators. I've had educators look at me and say things like, my job is not to talk to my students about my feelings. <laughs> you know, it's like, okay, well, welcome to England. <laughs> um, I mean, literally, um, and people just pushing the content away. But I'm here to say that things are changing. Uh, there's actually a commission now uh, under the auspices of the Aspen Institute, where we're trying to create the research agenda, um, the uh, curricular agenda, and the policy agenda for the entire field, so that it will be known in terms of the science and practices, so that we can create policies, so that every school can be, in many ways, required to do this. And I won't get into too much of the science now, but let's, let's get going about you, because it's all about you. As a matter of fact, one of my students, I got my course evaluations the other day, and one of my, I, you know, students say, oh my God, when he tells these anecdotes, it fits in perfectly in a line with every lecture. And the other students say, if I hear one more freaking anecdote from Professor Brackett, I'm gonna kill myself. <laughs> so I'm gonna balance that today. 
Um, this is our mood meter. It is a tool to help you build awareness. And if the colors are not clear, that's yellow, red, blue, and green. Pleasantness. Pleasantness has to do with what's going on for you here. It's your private subjective experience. It's how you're feeling about being here right now. It could be also be about your life, but that's too much for me to handle. So I want to know how you're feeling about right now. Minus five, you're already bored, you can't stand me, you'd rather be at work, you'd rather be sitting in a coffee shop contemplating your life. Minus three, you're thinking to yourself, like, like, here, you're kind of neutral. Plus three, you're thinking to yourself things like, oh my goodness, an hour with a guy talking about feelings. Plus five, I don't know, you're thinking about me as maybe you're, you want to move in. Right? Like, oh my God, Mark can be my personal emotion coach. So where are you right now in terms of your level of pleasantness? Do you have a number from minus five to plus five? That's all I'm asking you for. Just, this is a really important factor because it's like when you walk into a home, when you walk into a classroom, when you walk into a store, like I'm staying at this hotel, the Stanford Park Hotel right here. The waitress, unbelievable. She remembered my name from yesterday. She remembered exactly how I liked my coffee. She said good morning. And it's like, I just want to stay there. I want to go back. I want to approach because, right, she made me feel comfortable. She, was, she smiled. You know, she was just interesting. Um, how many of you have been at places where you get like, what do you want? Right? It's a, you get a feeling. So everywhere we go, we get these feelings, whether it be in a workshop like this, whether it be in a restaurant, whether it be walking into a classroom or into, a, into an office meeting. Minus five to plus five. Where is your pleasantness today? Energy. So the question is, do you have the energy to survive? Right? At plus five, you feel highly energized. You could fight your way out of a battle. Right? At minus five, you feel like all of your resources are depleted and you just, you know, you can't even get up with a, someone trying to pick you up with a crane. So where's your energy right now? Minus five, you're falling slowly into the earth, wanting to disappear. Plus five, you have the strength, the energy, the activation levels that you need to get through the day. Got that? All right. Obviously, these two dimensions make our four quadrants. So where are you now? What color are you in today? Where would you plot yourself right now? Got a color? All right, so now what's the word? What's your word for today, for right here, for right now? All right, let me have you freeze. Raise your hand if finding a word was slightly challenging. Put your hands up high, really high. Okay, look around the room. So 50 to 60, 70 percent of the room is emotionally illiterate. <laughs> so, more seriously, why? What made it? What do you think was challenging for you? So I already had an idea in my head, but then I was trying to match it to, you know, what I was feeling. Uh huh. This chart and it didn't quite. So you're kind of like you're not sure if that word fit where you think you're feeling and your energy is. Right. All right, so you're just kind of playing around with like, what's the match? How about for you? My energy is so low that it was just too hard to think about it. <laughs> All right. Yeah, so you're just like, you can barely, you're barely conscious. Uh, any other hypotheses around the finding of the word, the challenge with that? It's hard to pick one that like that's precise because a lot of different ones. Other thoughts about the challenge, yeah. Yeah, I think that if I had like a bunch of choices in each of the cat, I could not, not even by category, but by just a bunch of emotional uh, choices. Of, you know. So if I gave you words like, are you feeling content, peaceful, relaxed, yeah. or happy, excited, elated, ecstatic, or down, disappointed, devastated, or hopeless, or despair, or angry, <laughs> enraged, livid? Peeved. <laughs> so, but so, but, right. If you had the language, you might be able to access it more quickly in terms of how you're feeling. Makes sense. So it brings up another potential hypothesis, right? That how many of us are really trained in building emotional self-awareness? What do you think? 
How much training did you get in your homes, in your families, uh, at school? One class. Um, so it's just not part of our education. That's one of the goals we have here, right? To make this a permanent piece of children's education. As a matter of fact, in our training for our students, there are 16 feeling words every year that cover the gamut of one's human experience. So this is preschool, am I right? Kindergarten, preschool, all the way up to fifth grade. So what's six times 16? 96. So the goal is that every student that graduates from this school and goes into a sixth grade will go with 96 emotion concepts. And that's pretty cool, don't you? 96 emotion words that they can use to describe their emotional life. Which means 96 divided by four is what? About 24? 24. 24 words for each quadrant. That's pretty impressive. Most of you have two. <laughs> so when we think about the skills of emotional intelligence, and we think about identifying emotion, we have articulated these five skills. So if you go back to this mood meter, think about it. You're, you're trying to recognize what's my pleasantness and what's my energy. That's basically trying to identify or recognize your emotional state. To get the language for it, oftentimes what I've learned is that you've got to figure out where it's coming from. Like, where, why am I feeling? Like, I'm in the yellow. Okay, wonderful. Well, why yellow? Why not green or blue? I'm in yellow because I'm at a training. Okay, so what word might you use to describe being in the yellow and being at a training that you're enjoying? Oh, excitement. So sometimes thinking about the cause of your feeling or the cause of your color helps you get more precise and granular with your feeling. But then you also, oops, you also need the words, the labels. So is it down or disappointed? Is it peeved or irritated? Is it content or peaceful? Is it happy or is it elated? And what we say in our center is that you have to name it to tame it. That until you have the language, it's hard to know what to do with that feeling. Now the last two skills, which we're not going to focus on today, that'll have to be on my fifth visit, Scott. <laughs> right. um, you're, going to get the, you're going to get the award for the most visits. Um, is the E and the R, right? The expression and the regulation of emotion. So the first three skills, what I argue, are the three skills that help you identify your emotional experience, right? What color am I in? Why am I in that color? All right, where in that, where in the gradation? Okay, I'm feeling high yellow. It's because I'm at this workshop learning about emotional intelligence and making me a better parent. Oh, wow, I'm ecstatic. Make sense? Then you've got to figure out, what am I going to do with that feeling? Do I share it? Well, lo and behold, there are rules around that. Think about that, right? There are rules around sharing emotions. Like, am I in a safe place to share how I'm feeling? How are people going to respond to what I say? Is this aligned with my culture? If I'm coming from a tough area in New York, am I going to be seen as weak if I share how I'm feeling? Or am I going to get bullied because I share how I'm feeling? If I'm here, for example, my students who um, you know, come mostly from privileged backgrounds, they re they're really phobic about sharing their anxieties and stressors. Why? Because they think that I'll see them as weak. Right? You're weak if you're a Yale student who is anxious. Even though my research shows that 70% of them are anxious 95% of the time. I'm like, God, you don't have to tell me. I'm just looking at you. You're a wreck. <laughs> um, and they're actually getting angry with me. I'm fascinated. My students have been, I've gotten some like, harsh feedback from my students that I'm pushing them too hard to be self-aware, which is mind-blowing to me. But yet, they're so unaccustomed to it, they've been suppressing and suppressing and suppressing. Interestingly enough, this year I did some studies on that, and what I found was that the students say things like this. You know, when I was in high school, <clears throat> I had to take the drugs, I had to push myself, the Red Bulls, the staying up till 3 o'clock in the morning because you know, you've got to get into Yale. And then they get into Yale, and they think, oh, I'm going to yeah, I'm free. And they realize within the first two days that they're not the brightest crayon in the box, 
right? That there are other bright crayons. And some of them have more privilege than they have, and they have different backgrounds than this, and da 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 And all of a sudden, they lock themselves up, and they start putting themselves under that pressure again. And they get really stressed out. And I try to teach some strategies. No, Professor Brackett, I gotta keep up. I gotta be number one. I gotta, you know, I gotta get, it's gonna be really hard to get into medical school. I wanna go to Harvard Law School. Like, it's, like, it's impossible to get in there. So I gotta kill myself to get in there. And then I said, oh, I'm gonna use what you're teaching me when I get into grad school, right? <laughs> Right? And then I teach the medical students at Yale. I mean, they are so messed up, you have no idea. Like, I don't want any of them operating on me. It's like, I had one medical student this year. I'll never forget it. I'm doing my first training for the students. They're first year medical students. The guy is on his computer. I'm trying to get them to pay attention to do a little bit of a mindfulness exercise. And I said, so what's your strategy going to be? And the guy, he looks at me and goes, I'm giving you five minutes. If I don't feel like it's important, I'm going back on Facebook. <laughs> this is in front of the other 85 medical students. I'm not gonna share with you my response to that. <laughs> um, so there's all this like thing about expressing, isn't it? Like there's all these things like your personality, your um, culture, your race, your gender, your power level in an organization. I find even in my own center, that many of the people who um, work under me, quote unquote, don't want me to know how they feel. Because they feel that I'll judge them for that, which is crazy since I run the Center for Emotional Intelligence. <laughs> but their implicit kind of mindsets are ones that like, if I tell Mark that I'm anxious about the study that he's asked me to run and I don't really know how to do it, again, he's gonna see me as weak. And my theory is, wait, just the opposite. I'm paying you, right? I don't want you, ruminating for three weeks about how to do the study. Come to me, tell me how you're feeling, and I'll provide you some supports. Think about it. Yeah? I don't know if you take questions in the middle. But I'm not flexible. Um, let's say there actually, let's say there is a culture where maybe it isn't welcome to share your emotions. Yeah. I mean, other than like removing yourself from it, like, I mean, how, how do you sort of, sort of like balance, balance yeah. So the goal that I have is to shift the culture, which is why doing this work, for example, here um, at Phillips Brooks School, is that it's two things that we're focusing on, right? It's about helping to give all the teachers, right, the permission to feel and have their feelings, because they're having them whether we like them or not, right? Whether they're helpful or unhelpful, we're all having the feelings, right? We know from our research that if you suppress them for too long, right, there's going to be problems, right? You're going to have health problems. You're going to be miserable, right? So let's focus on shifting that culture and climate. But we also need to teach the skills, right? You have to teach these skills and teach people the reason why it matters. Because if people don't understand why it matters, they're not going to want to learn it. It's like um, the same thing like I said in my little opening talk this morning, right? If you don't understand the difference between having like, this goal of performing versus the goal of learning, you know, I find that my students at Yale, a lot of them have these fixed mindsets about learning. Because they say things like, I just gotta get the grade to get to the next place. And I say, I understand that, but like my classes, you know, I could care about grades, which is a problem, because they, the universe doesn't like that I say that. And I don't, I don't think, I, my goal, I, I could care less if the students remember the date of the paper that I wrote in 2007 that did these three studies on emotional intelligence. Right? I don't even remember those papers. I want them to learn the skills. I want them to use these skills with their roommates when they're making choices around drugs and alcohol. That's what I care about. I'm still not there with even my university. Can't convince them yet that this should even be just like a pass-fail kind of class that let everybody take it, but make it part of the kind of ethos. We're not there yet, I'm working on it. So that leads us to the last piece on regulating emotions, that last skill. What are the strategies that we use? Once we name it, right, we have to decide, do we want to keep it? Is it a feeling that's going to help in this goal that I'm setting for myself? Or is it a feeling that's going to get in the way and I have to shift it? I think important, most people's mindsets around regulating emotions is to get rid of the negative emotion. That's not what this is about. Emotional intelligence is about using every emotion wisely. Think about that. My uncle, who passed away, who was my hero in life, when he died, I was walking around the Yale campus. 
a psychiatrist friend of mine came up to me. He looks at me and he's like, heard about your uncle? I said, yeah, it's really, really feeling it. And he goes, it's a good thing you teach those skills in your program, Mark. I'm like, <laughs> not really sure what you're getting at here, John. And he didn't want to, he just, he just like, then he just walked away. I'm like, oh, okay, so I guess you're not really comfortable talking about feelings, right? Think about the messaging, right? It's a good thing you teach those skills, Mark. Um, I can't tell you how many people were like, Mark, let's go for a beer, let's distract, you know, get away from it, like, you know. And I was like, no. Actually, the loss of my uncle has brought me some really interesting emotions that I'm dying to explore and memories that I have of like, me being 22 and sitting in the Dunkin' Donuts in Fort Lauderdale working on our book together, <laughs> right? Like, I want to go there and live it for a little while. I don't want to suppress it and not feel it. But yet we're so used to saying to people, get rid of the feeling to move on, get rid of the feeling to move on, as opposed to use the feeling, right? So what I did is that when my uncle passed away, I actually went away for a couple of days and did some writing because I've been working on a book on this and I was like, I can take, you know, it's bringing up all these different ideas for me. Like, let me use that emotion wisely to re have um, the ideas about things I would never think about otherwise. Now, labeling emotion. Having and using a nuanced vocabulary to describe the full range of emotions. That's the focus of today. So remember, your students, your children, are learning all the skills. What I would argue is that the first step is getting that language down. You gotta name it before you know what to do with it. Same with you as parents, right? If you are not accurately labeling how you're feeling, or accurately labeling how your students or children are feeling, how are you gonna support them? Think about that. So, just so you know, there are 2,000 words in the English Language Dictionary that we could use to describe our feelings. Most of us use very few, right? We find that people just have a difficult time. And I don't know what it is yet. I'm still trying to figure it out, whether it's cultural, whether it has to do with our upbringing, whether it has to do with the lack of education in this area. Um, I think it's all of the above. I, mean, I think it's just different for different people. But what I do know is that when I do these little experiments and I try to get people to free associate like language that they have for these different quadrants, people really have a hard time coming up with maybe 40 words max. Never seen anybody come with more than 40 words, 50 words max. So think about it. there are basic emotions, like happy, sad, anger, fear, surprise, and disgust. Actually, a famous researcher out here in San Francisco was a pioneer of these kind of basic emotions. He's been debunked since his big discovery. But nevertheless, there are what you might call these just basic feelings. Happy, sad, anger, fear, surprise, disgust. We also know that there are these progressions of emotion. Right, that it's not just happy, there are gradations of happiness, right? What's a little bit of happy? Tiny bit of happy. Anyone? Joy. Joy, even less joy. Content. Contentment. Pleasure. Pleasure. And what's a super duper lot of happy? Ecstatic. So you can think about it. You can go from being pleased or content to being ecstatic. Same thing with the anger family, right? You can go from being annoyed or peeved or irritated to angry to livid or enraged. Same thing with the anxiety family. You can go from feeling uneasy, uncomfortable, nervous, all the way up to panic. There are complex emotions too. These are what we call oftentimes self-conscious emotions. They are not, more, 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 these are more developmental in terms of how we learn them because you need to be in social experiences to learn them, like the feeling of guilt or shame. And then there are these complicated blends. Here's your big question, the big test of the day. What is the difference, or not the difference, what, is, what emotion is the combo of anger and disgust? Shame. Contempt. Sorry. Outrage. Outrage. Anyone else? So, was it you who said contempt? Winner, front row. 
Contempt. Contempt is the combination of anger and disgust. So here's a way, here's a little graphic depiction. Right? You can see how there are, you can go from serene to joy to ecstasy, from acceptance to trust to adoration, from apprehension to terror, from distraction to amazement. One thing that people don't uh, know a lot about is this one here, this vector of boredom, which actually leads to hatred. I only discovered that I really, that made sense to me when I, because I really had terrible history teachers and social studies teachers. It just, just got randomly assigned to terrible history teachers. <laughs> and I never knew why I hated history. Now I love history in my 40s. I hated history as a kid and in high school. And why? Because it was so boring. And I didn't realize that the, I misattributed right, the boredom to hatred. All right, so Scott said, you gotta, you gotta get these people's vocabulary up. It's, they come into <laughs> meetings, they can't describe anything. So I'm, the rest of this, the next few minutes are gonna be your quiz. And you can work in partners. There will be um, a prize that either you will get or I will get. You didn't know that, Scott. <laughs> so um, we're going to bet a $20 gift certificate to my favorite coffee shop, which happens to be in this area, Blue Bottle, the one run in university. I like it there. 20 bucks. I, Scott is going to, you can handle it? Yeah. All right. So you're going to be paying me the extra 20 bucks, right? In um, on behalf of your parent team. <laughs> but the question is, well, let's see if we can do it. So I'm going to ask you, you have the next one minute to work with a partner. So you've got three seconds to find a group of two or three in your area. Ready? Three seconds. Two seconds. One. A group? Yeah, no, that's it. You're in your group. Now you're in your group. You got your small groups? Okay, freeze. So my hunch is that if you can afford to send your kid here, you can actually afford to buy me the gift certificate. <laughs> I, got, I just saved you 20 bucks. Are we all willing to make the $20 bet? Yes? What do we get if we win? You get the 20 bucks from me. You get, the, you get whatever, you, to any coffee shop you want. If you all get it right. <laughs> But, you know, I'm not a professor at Yale for no reason. All right, here's the, re here's the first one. Anger and disappointment. What is the psychological difference? Not anything else. The psychological difference. What's the difference in what makes someone feel angry as opposed to disappointment? You've got 30 seconds. Go. Okay, time. Which group feels confident? Yes? You're confident? Of course. <laughs> wait, wait, wait. My greatest weakness. All right, you're confident? You're confident? Confident? All right, so we're going to... Who else is super confident? Confident in... In knowing the actual psychological... <laughs> All right, so we're going to take these three groups. All right, who will go with you guys first? So what is the there's a difference in expectation between what is, what, what is perceived or what's reality and what it should be. Uh -huh. Whereas anger is sort of more raw, raw emotion that's not necessarily just from women, but the expectation. Okay. How do you feel about your... <laughs> <Pretty good. laughs> that's good. Like many people, you're wrong and you feel good. <laughs> just kidding. Um, so you're, you're halfway there. You get decaf. <laughs> uh, how about this group? Do you feel you can add on? Uh, yeah. So I think with anger, you externalize your feeling a bit more. So you displace how you feel onto others, and that creates negative interactions. Mm -hmm. Whereas with disappointment, it's more of in, an internalization of how you feel. And so you're still trying to process it, but you're not letting on to others that you might feel disappointed about. Ah. So I'm hearing you, and I like what you're saying. However, I'm not hearing the psychological difference in, between the emotions. Like, what would be the things that would make someone feel disappointment as opposed to anger? Do you got it? I'm not sure if it's any different from the two other groups. I, was, I 
latch on the word anticipate. Uh -huh. If I meet you and you don't recognize me, but I anticipated it, I might be disappointed. In anger, you kick me in the shins by accident, and I just have a flash angry. I didn't anticipate anything. Okay. So, freeze there. The workshop is over. You're going home. You're going to see your kids later on today. How many of you feel confident in having a rich discussion differentiating anger and disappointment? It's fascinating, isn't it? So, let's give a scenario here at the school. I am a student in fourth grade, and I um, am taking a test. The test has 15 different pieces. And the teacher gives me a study guide. It says, here's what you need to do for the test. These 15 things. I study for the test. Only the 15 things that the teacher promised to me that would be on the test were on the test. I get a C, I don't get an A. How do you think I feel? Angry or disappointed? Disappointed. Well, let's think about it. Everything was legitimate. Legitimate. Like there were 15 things on this test. I knew exactly what the 15 things were. The test was legitimate. I just didn't do as well as I thought I was going to do. Yes. Do you see? Now, one little difference. The teacher, right, put some surprise items on the test. And she said, well, you know, I give you the study guide as a guide, but, you know, everything's free game in this class to be tested on. I get everything right except for those items that I didn't even think I needed to study for. How do I feel? I'm pissed. Right? Because why? I perceive what the teacher did as being unfair. So anger's theme is unfairness and injustice. Whereas disappointment's theme is unmet expectations that are legit. Now here's the problem. How many of us confuse those two emotions? Right? Honey, why are you so angry? You're labeling my feeling as anger when I'm actually experiencing disappointment. Right? I may be acting out anger too. I hate school, I'm never going to remember, I can't attend this class, the teacher sucks. Right? Well there might be, but I'm thinking about just how you respond to it. Because I may be yelling and screaming, I hate this class, I'm never going back, I hate this teacher, she's not fair. Right? And then you find out, well, everything was fair. Wow. So my child is acting out like it's anger. Right? I'm now, like when I was, I was a kid who acted out a lot because I was dysregulated, what did I get? My mother yelling at me, wait till your father gets home, get up to your room. And my father would get home, I dare you talk to your mother like that one more time, right? Meanwhile, like, I'm feeling humiliated and shamed because I'm being bullied, or I'm feeling disappointed. So you can see how we have to be super mindful and careful about us, as the adults, attributing emotion. And we make that mistake a lot. We actually don't necessarily think about how our kids' feelings are, or what they are, we make attributions about what we think they're feeling based on their behavior. Without knowing the underlying cause, you're not going to know the true feeling, and you're not going to be able to truly support them. I and mean, that's really the thing. Right? You're not going to really know how to strategize, because the disappointment is, all right, let's really think about how you studied. Let's really think about the process that you went through to take the test. If it's anger, Maybe I need to have a conversation with the teacher and say, you know, my son's telling me this, is this what happened? Like, you know, let's talk through it a little bit so he can be better prepared because these big surprise tests are just making him really anxious, blah, 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 blah. All right, so anger, a feeling of perceived injustice, disappointment, feeling like your expectations are not met. So, so far, I think we're doing $20 for each one. Thank you, baby, right? I got my first five cappuccinos. All right, now this is a big one. This one's worth 40. Because now we got four words. We got anxiety, fear, stress, and pressure. So they're all like in the same family, aren't they? They're all red, but they're all maybe a little different. 
All right, I'll give you one minute in your group. You lost your partner, so you can join another group. So who, uh, who feels they can differentiate these four? Yes, you wanna go for it? Me? Yeah. Oh, sure. Um, so anxiety uh, is externally focused, or, or, or no, sorry, try that again. Anxiety is about something you don't know is coming, but you like think maybe it's coming, where fear is a known thing that's out there that's lurking. Uh, stress comes from inside us, and pressure comes from outside of us. So stress is like, I have this expectation of myself that I had better meet, uh, and I'm stressed out about it, whereas pressure is oh my God, Scott is gonna fire me if I don't uh, readjust the video so that you're, uh, there you go. Um, so, so pressure is from outside, stress is from inside. What do you think? Anyone, anybody wanna add to anything? Add to anything? I think you're doing pretty well there. Let's see. Anxiety, feeling uncertain about the future. Fear, feeling like there is an impending danger. Stress, feeling like you have too many demands and not enough resources. Whereas pressure is a feeling that something at stake is dependent upon the outcome of your behavior. Very often, students, for example, uh, at my university, confuse stress and pressure. And when I find that they're actually experiencing a lot more pressure than they are stress, because they have this resource and they have the ability to do it, but that pressure is what's killing them. All right, guilt and shame. <laughs> Anyone? Yeah. Everybody's like, I hate this class. <laughs> <laughs> All right, guilt is more about like, uh, I did something to someone and I'm just feeling so guilty and you know, bad about it. And where shame is more about like, what do you think of me if I've done something publicly, like we were saying, if I fall, if I fell by myself, I probably would just be like, yeah. but if I fell in front of people, I'm like, oh my gosh, who saw me? Uh -huh. Or if I made a mistake in front of an audience, yeah. I feel that wave of shame. I don't feel guilt. All right, let's see. Guilt, a feeling of responsibility or remorse for something you did, whereas shame is a bad feeling about oneself that can result in diminished self-worth. Which one is more difficult to deal with? Shame. It's a real challenging one. To me, shame is one of the killers of our kids' self-esteem. Why is that? Because oftentimes shame is put upon you, right? So people um, who are victims of bullying, people who are made fun of, right, start internalizing how other people are defining their reality. Right, that's how shame starts building and building and building. Much more challenging to deal with. All right, I think we have one more, two more. Compassion and sympathy. <laughs> Go for it. Remember, remember the whole thing that I said in my little opening about taking risks and not being <laughs> fear. It's okay to make a mistake. We're not going to think you're stupid if you don't know the difference. We may judge you, but. <laughs> Um, so I think compassion feels like a sort of a relating to somebody like you know, the humanity. Like it's 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 a sort of a higher order I call it. Uh -huh. Sympathy feels like sort of like I am sympathizing with you. It's like it, it doesn't have that same sort of humanitarian connection. I guess. Good point. Let's see. So compassion is being moved by another suffering and wanting to help. Whereas sympathy is merely feeling sorrow for someone else's misfortune. So the compassion is a bit deeper, a bit more profound. All right, last one. Oh, maybe it is a lot. All right. So let me share with you what this looks like here at a school. So in the feeling words training, as you can see, that's the red quadrant, the blue, the green, and the yellow. Every year, right, what students are learning are four new emotion concepts per quadrant. So you think about that, four times six is 24. So that by the time they would leave here, they would have 24 discrete emotion <coughs> concepts.
process for every quadrant. There are steps to that process. It's a four-step process. And what we say is if you take the four steps seriously now, you can avoid the 12 steps later. <laughs> so the first is the personal association. A big part of the Feeling Words curriculum is the training for the teachers and how to tell stories that are relevant and meaningful around their own experiences with the feeling words. So for example, when I teach the feeling words curriculum, I actually, there's a special twist to it. My storytelling has to be so clever that I never reveal the word. That's a pretty good example of that. I told you so much about my uncle, right? If you were here in the morning, who was my hero and my mentor. Well, about two years before he passed, he was 80, and I, have to, I was in England. And I was working in London at some schools, and the, the head of this prestigious school called me into his office and said, you know, Mark, we've got a call from the Prime Minister's office, and they want to come hear you speak about ruling. And I was like, oh, wow, you know, it's just an amazing feeling. And in that moment when I got that news, the first thing I had to do was what? I had to call Uncle Marvin, right? So I take, take my phone now, I call Uncle Marvin, who's you know, this 80 year old man sitting in Fort Lauderdale, Florida, in Dunkin' Donuts. <laughs> and I call him and he's at Dunkin' Donuts. <laughs> and I'm like, Uncle Marvin, like, you're not gonna believe it. Like, think about this. Like, that little thing that you started back in the 60s in this little classroom in the middle of the Catskill Mountains, like your nephew is having the opportunity now to share this with the government, you know, of England. And I remember, I can still remember the tone of his voice, right? Still, I can remember, you know, that feeling that I had in that moment when I was able to kind of acknowledge my uncle and to give him that pleasure, right, of knowing that the thing that he had started had really gone somewhere. What word do you think might be used to describe the feeling that I had? Proud. Grateful, proud. There's an excitement component to it, isn't there? So the word that we're going to be learning today is elation, right? And elation is this magical combination of joy and pride and accomplishment. So that's the way the feeling words are done. What we're doing is we're working with teachers to teach them how to do these tight and sweet three-minute stories. If they're more than three minutes, you get punished. If they can't be long, they have to be tight. And then we give students the opportunity to think about their lives. So when have you felt that way? And I say, now think about your life. You heard my story. Now, my story was a big one in my life with my uncle. Your story could be completely different. It could be here at school. It could be in a sports team. It could be in your family. I want you to think about a time when you felt that combination of joy and pride. And then students get the opportunity to reflect and think about their own life experience, and they write about them. I felt this way when, and they get to describe it a little bit. The next step is where it's related directly to a character in social studies, history, science, whether we have discovery. So if it's, you know, they're learning about, you know, um, whoever, um, Lewis and Clark, right? But that feeling that Lewis and Clark had when they were going up to Mississippi, or if they're thinking about world history, whatever they're learning. And then they get to describe the emotional lives of the characters that they're learning about. And then guess what they get to do? They get to go home to you. And then they get, they get to become your teacher. And they say, hey mom, hey dad, I have learned this amazing word today. And that word is elation. And it means this. And we learned about it and we talked about it in this topic area. I need to know, when did you feel that way? Tell me a time in your life when you felt elated. And then they come back and then they work in groups to think about, all right, so what do we do with these feelings? How do we 
create more elation in our classrooms, in our schools, in our families? How do we help someone who's not in to get the opportunity to experience elation? What about if it's alienation? What can we do to prevent students in our school feeling alienated and isolated and excluded? What do we do when we notice it? How do we manage it in the moment? And that's a process that gets repeated and it gets more and more obviously sophisticated and challenging as the kids develop across time. So that in the beginning, maybe what do we need to do to feel a little bit more, a little bit less of sadness or fear? And then later on, they start thinking, well, how do we prevent that feeling from happening when we know it's not going to be helpful for someone in that situation? And then as they get even older, they start thinking about what are the things that I can do in the moment versus long term? So if we have a problem with a child who's feeling elevated in this school, using a design thinking process, maybe the immediate strategy is not the long-term strategy. Maybe the immediate strategy is helping that student understand and feel less alienated in the moment, but we gotta change some policies and change the way we interact in order to make sure that child doesn't feel that way in the future. What do you think? Like, like I didn't get that chance. I always get so frustrated by this work because I never got the chance to live it. I only developed it you know, in partnership with my uncle and I've never, I feel like, I feel like envious of kids. When I interview kids who've been doing this work for five and six years, it is freaking mind blowing. I'm, I'm honest with you. Their brains, I mean, imagine the difference. Think about this school, Scott. There are kids that are in this school, right? And in five years from now, these kindergartners, first, second, third, fourth, fifth graders, right? Have done this process over and over again with different kids and different cultures and different backgrounds. And they've learned what strategies work for me, what strategies work for you. And they've been doing this in a developmental way and in fifth grade, compared to a school that doesn't do any of this stuff for kids. In my opinion, it is an injustice. Right? It makes me angry that not that every school doesn't do this for kids. Because I know that the, the pathways in these kids' brains are going to be vastly different than the kids who have no, who are not engaged in these very rich conversations and learning that language and learning those strategies. And when you interview kids that do this work, it, it just blows your mind. The writing that they can do, their writing is so much better. Their ability to problem solve around really difficult social issues is just so different. So that's my hope. I'm so excited to work with you, Scott, and your team. And uh, I'll just end by making a few statements. One, language constrains our cognition and perception. Think about that. Right. We, can, we have to have language to make meaning. And it enables and influences worldviews and larger cognitive processes. Right? Emotions can be meaning. Right? Understanding ourselves and others requires that knowledge or emotion and vocabulary. Labeling emotions helps us to communicate effectively. Think of the best writers and keeps us engaged, especially in the writing and writing process. And finally, um, what we now know from our neuroscientific research is that you really have to name it to tame it. That unless you have the mental model and the language to describe it in our experience, it's very hard to know what to do with it. Interesting? Yes. Cool. Pleasure to meet you for the fourth time. <laughs> um, I have a hunch that I'll be back just because can't get away from you, Scott. <laughs> um, nor can my email get away from him. But yeah. Um, super excited to work with you. Super excited to work with you, Sarah, who now everyone knows that Sarah is the director of emotional intelligence for this school. So we get to work with her to really kind of build this work and make it sustainable and uh, integrated. And um, I think it's only been about two years now that you've really started building this model, but it takes a couple of years to get it infused. And super excited to work with all of you and to make a difference in your lives and your kids' lives. So thank you.